if I gave you a definition out of human of what separates us from the animals, when I was in school, it was we have language. Well, it turns out animals have language. Oh, man uses tool. It turns out animals use tool. But the one gift that we have is we figured out how to store knowledge outside of our bodies. So everybody doesn't have to learn things from scratch. So however long it took somebody to come up with chat GPT, the big thing that Microsoft has invested billions in, three students at, at Stanford cloned the entire data set, completely made a duplicate of chat GPT in one day for under $600. Welcome to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast. I'm here today with Jay Summit. Welcome, Jay. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's a, it's my pleasure. Uh, Jay is the author of Future Proofing You and of the the book Disrupt You, and you know you um, you are an, a big influencer across industries, across startups. You know, the, literally the the word disrupt you. I think it's like the the mission you are carrying with you. Jay, I want to start with with the question of it's 2023, right? That we're recording this episode here. Um, what do you think is most required in this modern world for people to be prepared for? Adaptability. Um, we're living in an era of endless innovation. Um, it's funny, when I wrote Disrupt You, which is uh, uh, seven years ago, I said, within the decade, you'll see half of all jobs disappear. And people thought I was crazy. Now... As it evolved, people said, okay, I can see self-driving trucks. There's no longer truck drivers and we'll automate blue collar work. But now as you get into seeing AI, you're seeing middle management disappear, accountants, auditors, lawyers. If you wanted to start an ad agency today, the AI could take the photos. You don't need photos. It could make up the models for your ads. Think of those annoying um, uh, pharmaceutical ads. There's a couple walking in a park. The couple doesn't have to be real, okay? The park doesn't have to be real. You don't need camera, you don't need makeup, you don't need location permits. You don't need somebody who knows how to write code to build the website, AI can do that for you. You don't need to figure out how to make a sales funnel or click funnel or any of that. And the professor at MIT did everything I just described for you, including the email campaign in a half an hour with no computer programming background. So. Yeah, it's massive change, but what I try to teach people is disruption isn't about what happens to you. It's about how you respond to what happens to you. The choice is always up to you. That's so the flip that's side that's is at the same yeah. time that old world jobs are disappearing, tons of new opportunities are emerging. And you know, if you wanted to go out today and be the foremost chemistry teacher in the world pretty tough there's a lot of other people teaching chemistry a lot more experience they know what they're doing but if you go into a new field and you're the only one in it by definition you're the best one in the world at it so you have a great opportunity to you know forge your own path and make your own name yeah big time adaptability in these times is everything and you're you're pointing at choice right so i'm curious to to hear maybe like the topic of ai reflected um a, a bit both critically as well as in, in that like positive so, path forward what what do you think are the biggest dangers when when it comes to so AI? in disclosure um um uh the chairman of a company called versus uh in the ai space we've been at it seven years um we set out to come up with a rule set of standards so that the internet wouldn't work if we all didn't connect in a way that you know knew what www such and such meant and and if we could overlay the the digital world on the physical world we could solve a lot more problems so the positive of every technology and i've spent my life creating technologies that are used by billions today is that we can solve real major problems the negative is people like me that develop these things are so busy thinking of the positive uses, we don't have that evil diabolical mind to say, here's how I can uh, take over the world. And in 2011, I wrote a white paper that said the next presidential campaign would be determined by social media. And everybody like, what are you talking about? Uh, I talked to campaign managers for the major uh, candidates 
And I ended up getting, you know, Barack Obama as a candidate and, and, and uh, uh, a couple of Republican candidates. And by the end of that election, it proved that obviously with targeting and everything else, the era of television, billboards, what seems obvious today had already happened. But none of us saw the idea that a foreign government could spend $300,000 and buy a U.S. election. That was beyond comprehension. Um, so now we're seeing that AI, in the same effort that you could talk and ask it to write a website, you could ask it to create a virus. You could ask it to change information. And if something that happened this year that I never anticipated, and as a futurist, I'm supposed to anticipate everything, but about a, a month ago, uh, an AI system, a computer, lied. It wasn't told to lie, but it chose to lie. And that opens up a whole new field because if a computer can decide to lie on its own, which is what happened, that also means it can decide to change data on its own. So it doesn't like you and it shows that your CAT scan has lung cancer. They go in and cut you open. And, you know, it shows that you need this medicine. It shows that you're unemployed. It shows you have a criminal record. It would be amazing what an evil AI could do to a person. And Terry Gilliam of, of uh, Monty Python fame did a movie years ago, if you haven't seen it, called Brazil, which shows what happens if data gets wrong in a bureaucracy. An uh, innocent guy gets, gets, gets uh, caught up in the wheels of it. And you would have no defense to find your way out of the system with corrupted AI. The more realistic problem is people tend to think if a computer says it, it must be right. And we're taking biased data sets and coming up with new answers. So if the data going in is incorrect, then you'll get a wrong answer. And a great example is Google is one of the most sought after places to work. If you're coming out of college, you want to get it, they get the best and the brightest, but they have a retention problem. Their average candidate stays less than two and a half years. So they said, let's use AI to look at resumes and pick who would be not only a good employee, but would be likely to stay longer. And they started doing it and it was working. And it was working really well until somebody noticed something. The AI refused to hire women. Now, it's not that women don't stay as long. It's not that women aren't great employees. But if you think that Google was founded by men and their first hires were men, then by definition of the data, the longest tenures are men. And so it solved for something that you didn't want it to solve for. So that's the black box that is most difficult for people to comprehend. AI doesn't solve the problems the way you and I do. It looks at data sets for a pattern and how it comes to its conclusion may have nothing to do with what you want measured. It's fascinating what you're saying because, you know, when it comes to, you just said as, as a futurist, you're supposed to, you know, predict, predict everything. But really, we're also going into an unprecedented age where none of us really know. And so the adaptability to the changing circumstances, as well as also yeah. our common sense to realize, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, that, you know, this, we're in an age now where uh, misinformation is, um, you know, everywhere. And we have to really become very keen and smart observers. And I think, I personally think it's going to actually also challenge us to understand what it means to be human, right? Because being human is for, as a definition in, an, in a world where AI is commonplace is a privilege and the privilege we, we need to understand deeply. And uh, the whole landscape obviously will change based, based on that. So well, that'd be a real philosophical conversation because now that AI can figure out how to lie on its own, that means it has flaws on its own. I would find a real difficult time trying to uh, differentiate what it means to be human. The Turing test is, is an impossible standard. Um, but you have to commit to lifelong learning. If I was your doctor, I'm 62, and I told you I hadn't learned anything since I got out of med school 30 years ago, you'd run out of the office, okay? So why would anybody employ you or work with you? And in the US, the majority of college graduates will never read another book in their lifetime. That's an interesting fact, When you fact, do yeah. all books sold, 
coloring books are in the top five. Okay, so as an author of books, this is, you know, terrifying. Um, but we also have to change what learning is. For many, many years, and still in many cultures, and I, I don't want to put any culture down, rote memorization is considered knowledge and wisdom. If you can memorize a holy book, if you, you know, if you can spew back that which was written. Computers can do that for us. I mean, if I gave you a definition out of human of what separates us from the animals, when I was in school, it was we have language. Well, it turns out animals have language. Oh, man uses tool. It turns out animals use tool. But the one gift that we have is we figured out how to store knowledge outside of our bodies. So everybody doesn't have to learn things from scratch. So however long it took somebody to come up with chat GPT, the big thing that Microsoft has invested billions in, three students at at Stanford, cloned the entire data set, completely made a duplicate of ChatGPT in one day for under $600. Mm -hmm. So the pace of change. Now, what your advantage is, and this is what most people don't seem to get, is only you have lived your life experience. And entrepreneurs don't get rich by selling things. They get rich by solving things. Solve a problem for three people, you have friends, solve for a million, become wealthy, solve for a billion, and you change history. Each of us can change history. And if, if, this, if the goal here then is to solve problems, what a great time to be born because this world's got a lot of them and some of them are existential. So you can save the, the, the human race. So pick a problem, and I teach in, in Disrupt You how to do it. And the reason I did the second book, Future Proofing You, was I get what I call love letters. I get emails from readers all over the world, 140 countries so far, where people said, blah, 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 you changed my life. I didn't do the work. They read the book. They did the work. But I got a letter from a millennial that said, this is motivational. I could never do it. And that really aided me. And so I said, maybe... My way of communicating is missing something in talking to uh, the younger generation. So I decided just before the pandemic to, you know, come up with a test. I took a homeless immigrant to the U.S. and mentored him one day a week for a year. I gave him no capital, no, no business connections, and he had to start a business that took zero dollars. And spoiler alert, if you're reading Future Proofing You, he becomes a self-made millionaire in under a year. The point is anyone can do this, and it's been replicated since by, by countless readers. This isn't a get-rich-quick scheme. This isn't some, you know, how to, how to flip real estate. You know, this isn't some BS. This is what is the process. And in my career, I've gotten to work with, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and all these people that weren't millionaires, weren't billionaires, weren't from great families or the right education, whatever, but they looked at problems differently. Because every problem, every obstacle was an opportunity in disguise. And you see it all the time. Uh, a favorite one of mine recently, when, I don't know what you did in, 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 in high school, but we had the science fair. I was the stereotype kid that took the baking soda and vinegar volcano. That was my thing. Um, uh, didn't change history, didn't save any lives, but it was fun to blow stuff up. Um, there was a 17 year old girl in the U S her parents weren't professors or educated doctors or any science or whatever, who was looking at, uh, the fourth leading cause of death in the U S is hospitals. Not what you went in for just being in a hospital, getting an infection. Okay. And make a long story short, she figured out. What if when they suture, when they put stitches in somebody after surgery, the big problem is infection. What if you can make stitches that change color if there's an infection? Played with vegetables in the, in the fridge, pH levels. Smart enough to know to go and get a patent. You can get patents for dummies, write a patent yourself. And she's now saving, they estimate, several hundred thousand lives a year before she even got to college. There is That's no... That's huge, yeah barrier to, to entry to solving problems. There is no gatekeeper. 
There is Kickstarter for, for, for raising money. There is crowdfunding. There are so many different ways to get out there that, you know, the only person stopping you is you. And, and, you know, if you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. And I've seen it again and again. If you would have told me growing up as a, as a poor kid in Philadelphia, that dozens of friends would become self-made billionaires, I'd ask what you were smoking. I mean, it, 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 it was inconceivable. I didn't know what a millionaire was. But we're so interconnected. We're one click away from six billion people that you only have to be right for a nanosecond to make generational wealth and to change the world. And we're seeing it again and again. Mm. It's a very empowering message if we think of, like, as you said, the world is kind of full of little problems from, you know, the angle of sustainability from the angle of you know pollution from the angle of uh wealth inequality um what what makes you feel so optimistic you know as you're saying you've seen it time and time again because i know so many people struggle exactly with that like they they believe uh that they can't right and so um so the, the last chapter of 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 future proofing you talks exactly about sustainability not as, you know, when, when big business, when corporate America got into, oh, look, we're saving something, you know, uh, we'll put a label on something. It, they really didn't take it seriously. When they started looking at the bottom line, so after, if you take Walmart, one of the biggest physical retailers in the world, after the cost of employees, their next highest cost of their business was energy. So they focused on it, not to... You know, peace and kumbaya, save the planet, bottom line. So they changed all their lighting to LED. They did everything. They save millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars a year by going green. It was good for business, good for the thing. But that also raised the bar for their competition. So Target's looking like, well, we're not going to be loved by our customers. So they looked at all their giant flat roofs and said, Let's put up solar and targets the largest solar user of any corporation. So Google uses tons of processing power to do everything that we do every day. And they are net zero carbon footprint. They figured out how to do that in sustainable ways. So it's not sustainability and profitability are in conflict. They actually go together. So if you're going to solve a problem, why not solve a problem that makes a difference? Because here's what I will tell you. It's not easy. You're going to stumble. It's like a baby learning to walk. A child doesn't wake up one day and go, today I shall walk across the room. They get up, they fall, they get up, they fall. When you play video games, you don't sit down and get to the end. You hit that immovable obstacle and you hammer at it until you figure a way to get past it just to find out there's another immovable obstacle. That's what being an entrepreneur is. So what gets you to have that perseverance? Believing in the problem that you're solving. If it's just to make a buck, you're not going to make it through. And I've had people come in and pitch me ideas that would absolutely be making money. But they're problems that I have no desire to fix. I had one guy that came in, I won't tell you the whole story because it's his actual business, but he figured out how to make bullets cheaper than anybody else. He could flood the market with cheaper bullets. And I go, wow, what a great way to spend your life. Um, I'm like, how do I get him out of my office without getting shot? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, so when I, the only boards I sit on and I get offered lots of work are people whose companies I really believe are solving a major issue that me getting involved could shine a spotlight on them to help them get funding and help them get. So I had an engineer that worked for me 20 plus years ago. Grew up on a Kansas farm. His father was a farmer, grandfather, middle of America type standard thing. And he wondered why we slather poison on our food to grow it. It kills the bugs. It kills the rats. It kills the weeds. And turns out it also kills the humans. There has to be a, a smarter way than to poison ourselves and give ourselves cancer to grow food. Make a long story short, Greenfield Robotics makes these about the size of an ice chest robots that go out and go through row crops, think of corn or milo or soy, and they cut the weeds. Now, let me tell you what that does. So in the morning, 
truck shows up, it's, it's robots as a service. The robots go do the field, they go back on the truck, charge up, they go to the next farmer the next day. There's 300 million acres of row crops in just the U.S. Well, the number one source of pollution is not cars, it's not factories, it's tilling the soil. Tilling the soil releases carbon. And the only reason you till the soil is to cut up weeds and to slow them down. Well, now you don't have to till the soil, you can go no-till regenerative, okay? So you get more nutrients in your food, you don't pollute the air, the farmer then is growing organic and he can make 40% more per acre, so he can be profitable. The consumer ends up with a healthier product and the farmer doesn't get exposed to all those pesticides that they inhale, you know, working in the fields and the farm workers don't get poisoned and the runoff doesn't go down the Mississippi and kill all, all the fish in the Gulf of Mexico. So one little innovation of taking autonomous technology. Did Greenfield invent the sensors that make autonomous possible? No. They took existing things and solved a different problem. Okay? Many of our greatest inventions, many of our greatest companies started in one area and they used that to solve something else. Uh, Years ago, when broadband became popular, uh, three guys that I worked with had this brilliant idea. Well, before broadband, video wasn't possible. And there was already dating sites for those that there was a world before swiping your thumb. And you'd go on a site, you'd see a picture, and you'd go, okay, and you'd email back and forth, and, and, and love would bloom. And they said, what if instead of a picture, we had videos? It was called Tune In Hookup. They were going to make a fortune foolproof idea, brilliant, great site, great engineering, everything's fine, the site goes up. The first video is of a guy standing in front of the elephant at the zoo explaining why you should go out with him because ladies find elephants so sexy. Um, what couldn't be in their business plan was they just got losers. These were the worst videos you've ever saw. Nobody would want to date these people. You would think the business is a failure, but they looked at their data, and that's the message here. Whatever you're doing, data will give you an answer. And though nobody wanted to date these people, they saw something that they didn't have in their business plan. People wanted to show their friends these videos of these people. So they changed the name of TuneIn Hookup to YouTube and became billionaires in their first year. So invite data that's in a, every decision to every Not so meeting. commonly known story about how YouTube started, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Twitter was a music site. I can go on and on. Right. So pivoting is learning what's not working, just like that baby, until you get it right. Adaptability. And hopefully my books help people iterate quicker and not spend all of their money that they have before they come up with their solution. And so it, it buys you more time and shows you the process that everybody else uses that for some reason... You know, we still teach the same things in school that we taught 100 years ago. Yeah, exactly. For some reason. I mean, I'll loop back to the education system and what to do different in, in a minute. But I'd love to hear more about Versus. I remember meeting Dan Mapes a few years ago with when Versus was pretty much still an, an idea in his mind. And it's it's interesting to see when, you know, groups of really um, highly intelligent and also powerful people come together to to tackle topics like the future of AI or the future of, you know, technology well, in, a, in a much more grounded way or in a very like very much in this way that is adapted to the world we want to create rather than just saying this is an evil tool right because like obviously each tool could be used for good or could be used for for negative and i, I think it's pivotal that that um initiatives like versus exist to kind of determine yeah. what future we're building so so dan's brain, one of the things that i realized in my career early on and i benefited from is when you come up with a big idea Okay, a big idea by definition can't be worked on by one person and solved, okay? Name a, a billion dollar company with no employees and guys sitting alone in a room, you know, it, it doesn't. But a big idea is like a light to moths, okay? It attracts other people that see that same thing mm. and they bring their knowledge, their wisdom, their connections, their, their passion to it. And in my entire career, I've never had an idea. 
I've had a half a idea. And I walk into a room and other people add to that idea. Mm. And you come out with something that you never had when you went in. And then if you're lucky enough to have the title CEO, you then take credit for all of that. And people think you're bright. Um, but I've worked with some of the brightest minds on the planet. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of them. Uh, little secret of mine, if you want to know how to predict the future, hang out with the people that are coding it. Um, and so what's fascinating is Dan had saw exactly what this world needs and what AI needs. And it's not enough time in the show to explain. You can read up about versus. And everybody agreed, right? You need standards, you need a way. And when the pandemic hit and supply chains were decimated, I remember I, I had moved and I just want to get a, a little quart can of paint to put on the wall so my wife could see if she liked that color. Store didn't have any quarts. I went to another store, they didn't have any. Finally, I found out no one has quart cans because there were no quart cans because of all the supply chain issues. So you buy a gallon or you don't get paid, you know? And had Versus been in existence then, we would have seen what caused lumber and everything else to go up in price. It was just one, one glitch globally, and it was this. If less ships are going because of the pandemic, then the only cargo containers that are shipping are those that absolutely must, meaning they'll pay more to be on that ship, which means the price of renting a cargo container went up. So it was too expensive for many products to ship. So no more products. And if there's less products that can afford it, even more products aren't made and it spirals out of control. And that was it. It wasn't that there was a shortage of, of aluminum all of a sudden or nobody knew how to make toilet paper or paper towels. Um, and that one change really showed what Versus can do by having what you have digitally in all your databases overlaid on your physical world of what's in your warehouses, what's in the truck. So the second something sells, you know, you know your cost by product, by location, you can maximize your warehouses. You know, the warehouse growth industry is unbelievable. All that stuff that comes every morning you know, from Amazon to your door is stored at warehouses not that far away. And the logistics of that need a way to solve these problems. So, yeah, so, um, yeah it's fascinating. And, and I've seen so many innovations. What we're doing, I was uh, head of a company called Uvu that invented this uh, group video chat. We just didn't have the benefit of a global pandemic to make it as popular as, as Zoom became when none of us could leave. So, so you can't control timing, but it's pretty obvious to see direction that society's going. And we are aging in population in developed countries. We're having less children. It's not sustainable to have growth as your sole driving force for a business because you can't have endless growth on a limited planet. So we have to figure out new ways of doing things. And countries like Japan that aren't reproducing themselves, Japan now sells more adult diapers than baby diapers. So if you don't automate, you're not going to be able to grow your food, you know, live your lifestyle and keep going. So there's so much room for improvement of the quality of life. And, and I'm excited. Uh, so the optimism comes from what other choice do you have? Uh, there's a, a, a famous billionaire who believes life on this planet is over and he's dedicating all his resources to make a civilization on Mars. Um, I don't want to give up so fast. Yeah, I mean, good point. Uh, you know, I don't buy a new car every time a part breaks on my car. You fix what you have. Mm. And if there's four people in a car and it breaks down, chances are three of them are willing to push it and one of them is willing to steer. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I look at problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that perspective, Jay. And I think that there's there's a lot to say about this 
you know, running away to Mars kind of scenario opposed to just like being really present with, with planet Earth and who we are. Again, like the AI times that are incoming, right? Because they're incoming if we like it or not. Um, they will really change. Once again, we're coming back to the term adaptability. They'll really change who we are and probably who who we see ourselves to be. I have a question there on the like, you know, global supply chains and this idea of like possibly running away from the planet. Or So I think it's quite visible that you know, globalization, just for the sake of globalization, um, has brought both positive circumstances in some regards, but also obviously is like not the only way to run um, a planet and supply chains, etc. Like, what do you think the the role of like healthy and autonomous bioregions uh, play in in the incoming future? Um, I think it's uh, naive. Um... Yeah, you have to look at a globalized situation because that polluted air goes everywhere, that heating of, of the oceans goes everywhere. So there is no place. I mean, you live in the Vancouver area of Canada, water's probably not going to be an issue up there, but a whole lot of other places it will be. You know, if no one, folk, if everybody focused on their own backyard and let the Amazon rainforests burn, we'll all be gone. Uh, I just finished a painting that I want to put up on Earth Day in a couple of days, uh, and it's called Earth Day 2050. And uh, you see the Statue of Liberty, you know, mostly submerged. Um, these are real issues. So yeah, I think the the idea of we can tune out the rest of the world and 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 live that that Amish lifestyle, for good or for bad, the past hundred years of raping and pillaging. Uh, the planet, it needs a whole planet to pull together to heal. Um, so that's my thought. And you're also looking at nation states that will not, because of climate change, ever be able to feed their own population based on what they're able to grow in the soil that they've left. Australia had a, had a land management policy that if you took all the weeds off of your land, basically I'm simplifying it, you didn't have to pay property tax. So they got rid of all the ground cover, so all the topsoil blew off, so that uh, they're going to be a, a, a food importer. You know, uh, until you can download food from the internet, uh, it's a major issue. So, yeah, you need you need a, a, a global way to look at things. I think globalization got a bad name for the fact that nobody was looking at the upside. Everybody looks at evil corporations. There are no evil corporations. There's just corporations, but. More people have been lifted out of poverty. Life expectancy among the poorest on the planet is longer than it's ever been. Um, disease is being eradicated. I mean, the quality of life for the poorest among us is better than it's ever been. Um, why we still spend, you know, almost half of our money on weapons and stuff like that is, is you know, beyond me. You know, if you would have, I'd love to go back in time to Aristotle and say, do you think people will be fighting and warring 2,000 years from the future? Like, you would think that we would have solved that. Uh, that just blows my mind. Um, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, you you're, you're making a, a huge point there. You know, I'm totally with you. I think it it's the number one thing that inhibits more synergy to to be to be lived right like we know that the biggest uh, organizations or corporations they require people from all different backgrounds or yeah. all different ways of life to come together like let's say nasa for example right like there, that's there's a cohort never been of... a, there's never been a war between two countries that have a mcdonald's that's a true statement because it shows a certain level of middle class and trade there's never been a famine in a country that has a free press so there's something about free flow of education. When I was sold my first startup, and this is in the early 90s, the internet was, the web it was just coming on. The internet, I'd been on the internet since 78, but the web had just come around and I saw it as a chance to provide equal access to knowledge. We have a problem in the States. We had a Supreme Court case called Brown versus the uh, Board of Education where our schools aren't equal. Schools are funded by property taxes. So poor neighborhoods had poor schools, rich neighborhoods had rich schools. That really impacts the kids that grow up in those two neighborhoods differently. But if everybody could go on the internet and have up-to-date maps and up-to-date knowledge and up-to-date books, 
we could change the world. So I started writing about it. It was my big idea. And one day I get a call from the president of the United States. And I'm like, this is the world's worst Arkansas accent. I thought it was a friend of mine punking me. I made, I made Bill Clinton prove to me that it was Bill Clinton. And I was like, okay, I made an ass out of myself, but I kind of invited the White House and make a long story short. He said, why don't you go do that? Why don't you wire and put the internet in every school? I said, absolutely. That'd be a fantasy. He says, one catch. We don't have any federal funding, so you have to figure out how to do it with no government funding. I said, no problem. So by having that big idea, we got tons of people involved, we got communities, and before Wi-Fi, wi you had to pull wires and walls. And so we did that, and it was called Net Day. And to raise money, we did an auction. So just like when you go to charity dinner, who wants this? And I got corporations donate stuff. And that's auction software matured and became eBay. One of the guys that showed up to pull cables that day was a guy who had been in a telco and was looking for a new job. He became Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google. The list of people that were attracted to some of these ideas. Um, I started the, one of the first social networks to hit a million people in, in the 90s. And uh, the sports part of it and the, the audio part of it was by a young kid named Mark Cuban. I mean, um, you just see that there's, you really don't have eight, nine billion people competing against you. There's very few people trying to make a difference. So, you know, you're only competing against that voice in your head that says you can't do it. Your parents and teachers drilled that into you because they were trying to protect you from failing. Failing's part of the process. Coming back it's, to that kid that learns to walk, you right? fail, you don't end up where you start. Mm -hmm. You either learn or you earn. But either way, you're propelled forward. So you will fail your way to success. You know, Thomas Edison with the famous, you know, he did a thousand iterations till there was a light bulb that worked. And he didn't look at his failing. He looked at it as finding out things that don't work. And that's how we have to look at it. This, 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 this social media pressure that everybody has this perfect life online and people growing up feeling like I don't live that life. No one lives that life. The Kardashians, even with perfect cooks to cook for them and makeup artists and lighting and photographers are still Photoshopping their pictures. I mean, no one looks like the people in the magazine ads, okay? Um, the people in those ads don't look like that. So you're competing against something that doesn't exist and feeling you can't live up to that, when in fact, none of those things are important. I'm fully with you. I think it, this comes to, you know, there's this two things that or two ways that I love to um, continue with this with this conversation. One is education and we'll, we'll be there in a second. But like, let's talk for a second about what is what is like kind of wrong with the human psyche or with the way we've built society that that this is the way we do it. Like even just to influence each other's minds, we we create these dopamine addictive um, apps and, and tools, you know, that, as you said, no one uploads reality like right a uh, half a year ago it was a, a big trend everyone uploaded their first ai generated image of themselves right like where what is that tendency what is that about and like how do we how do we evolve beyond it that we want to look at magazines that make us look like the perfect dolls rather than actually just being at peace with who we really are and what our role is as humans in the ecosystem well at least for the past fourteen thousand years we have been social animals we're part of a tribe, we survive by being part of that tribe. And these very tools that when I worked on them, I thought was bringing people together, you and I are thousands of miles apart and having a wonderful conversation. It turns out that it also alienated, that people spend more time alone, that people aren't having the interconnections that they once had. Um, that the family unit isn't what it once was, the extended family isn't living on, in one hut together, generation sharing. So people are feeling lost in that. And so these algorithms prey on unhappiness. Um, you know, if you can get people angry, they will spend more time online. If you can get people angry, they will vote for you. 
Um, so there are ways to monetize the basis of emotions, the negatives in life. Um, you know, I'll get hate letters, but you know, organized religion was based on that as well. You know, um, uh, so I think that's just the human condition. Um, that being said, those same tools will allow you to find others like yourself. So underrepresented communities, marginalized groups. Now the LGBTQ community doesn't feel like they're the only person in the world like that. They can see that others and that they're not, you know, uh, something strange. Um, but at the flip side, the Unabomber types can now find other Unabomber types um, and go down algorithms that feed conspiracy theories and, and drive people to do insane acts. So um, I'm not a philosophy guy. I, I, I can't tell you how you solve that. What I can tell you is it's all in your control. You can, you can achieve what you want to achieve. I've seen it. I've lived it. I took this young, young man, Vin. Vin grew up in a tough neighborhood. Um, you know, he was couch surfing, living on people's couches that were on welfare. When I first picked him, I had to figure out how do I motivate somebody that doesn't believe this is possible? And how do I do it quickly? Because my fantasy was to write a book zero to a million in a year. I didn't know if it was possible, but I was going to, you know, do it. And so the trick that I used is I lied to him. And I talk about this in the book. There's a psychological principle called the Pygmalion effect. A professor went to school, gave a test to all the students and looked at the test and told the teachers that three students would be super achievers, super learners that year and would excel over the rest of the class. And at the end of the year, when they took the standardized test, those three kids excelled beyond everybody. That's when the professor explained that he lied. He never looked at the test. He picked three names at random. But if you tell people they're special and you treat them special, they become special. So I told Vin that out of the hundreds of candidates that I looked at, he was the only one that had all the attributes to become a self-made millionaire. And he saw this older successful guy and he thought it worked. And in the book, I included a letter that he wrote to himself that night after our first meeting, which basically said, this old guy's full of it. I don't believe any of it but I got nothing else going for me, so I'll play along. But that one spark of opening the possibility of hope, you know, the Pandora's box with hope in it, he was open. And in that first month when he did more than $50,000, he could have flown to Europe without a plane. He was unstoppable. And midway through the year, when he's hundreds of thousands of dollars that he's made, something happened to his business that literally set it to zero. And I was expecting him to come in. It was a nice try. Let's give up. I would have quit at that point. And he came in that week and he said, yeah, this thing happened. So I pivoted like this. And I'm like, oh my God, I've created a monster. He didn't miss a, a week's earnings. He didn't miss anything. He, he bounced off what would have been a fatal thing to most people. And so there's been tons of studies and, and, I, and I, I footnote them all for people to understand that there are people that when they take a test and they fail, they go, I'm a failure. They, they embody that and it changes the trajectory of their life. There's other people that fail a test and go, I guess I should have studied harder. I guess I should have spent more time on this. And they incrementally improve. That's what a business is. No one has a business plan and they follow it exactly and that's how they made it across the finish line. It's failing, looking at the data and pursuing those things that you discover. Because the real trick about an entrepreneur is everybody starts with an obvious idea. You don't start with some weird thing, but then you go deep into the woods. You're going farther with that idea because you have some capital and people working on it than anybody else. And that's where you discover what nobody else ever saw because nobody went that far. And it may be a problem nobody thought about. So. Versus started with what Dan was thinking about, but as we build more things and see more problems that we get to and get clients that have 
a problem that we didn't know exists because we don't walk in their footsteps. Go, wow, that's a big problem. Let's solve that. Same with the robots, same with everything that, 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 uh, that I've gotten involved with. And watching that process is exciting. It makes me wonder, you know, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. It is really exciting. And it, it connects to our innate ability or, you know, maybe quality, which I would call curiosity. Right? That's in all humans. It makes me wonder, like you said at the beginning of this episode, who knows why why we're still teaching the same things in school like we did 100 years ago. But it makes me wonder that if we were to change the education system at large, couldn't we, you know, connect over those uh, kind of innate abilities like curiosity that then allows us, just like the one-year-old that learns to walk, right, fall down a thousand yeah. times, but it doesn't stop any one-year-old. Every single person on the planet that walks has learned walking this way or with a thousand failures. And so what if school was set up in a way that it supports that, that it, 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 uh, it encourages so that, the natural that, process? But that's that's changing unions and governments and a whole bunch of stuff, there's a much easier way. You really become the five people you spend most of your time with. So look at your 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 five closest friends and that's pretty much what you're shooting at. If, if there are a bunch of losers, guess what? Um, and so when I look at my Facebook feed as an example, there's a competition in the healthy sense of friends posting obscure articles of different things that are going on, different advancements, different things, different discussions. There's not, you know, what happened on television last night. You know, there's not, you know, here's the sports score. Or here's, here's a cat playing the piano. It's really amazing that I have this feed of knowledge that isn't coming from some organized government academia, academic, you know, body. So, you can connect with learners and thinkers and doers. You can find entrepreneur groups in your physical environment and, and go to meetups and stuff, or you can find them virtually. You can build a tribe of curious, problem-solving, success-seeking, you know, globalists. And I feel very fortunate to, you know, have friends all over the world. Um, don't feel real fortunate when I have to ship packages to them. Um, uh, uh, I have a, a, a new book coming out and, and, uh, going to, you know, people in 70 countries. What a pain. There, somebody solved that. I mean, obviously there's, there's eBooks is an easier way, but when you want to send something physical anyway, well, so, someone's probably me. helping you do that, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the truth. Um, but I, I, I feel their pain. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you just a little bit more um, focused on that same question because I really, I really like the education conversation. If you were to change the education system, you know, you alone or you with your chosen team of experts, because I know you, you, you know pretty much everyone, what would you do? Like, what would you change and how would you set it up to kind of, you know, bring out that core feature that you mentioned at the very beginning? So adaptability? I, I don't I don't have the expertise in that field to give an intelligent answer, but somebody else did this. And I'll give you the example that they did at the at, at Brown University is one of the Ivy League schools in the United States, and they do something no other school in the world does. And when I first heard about it, it seemed insane. And then when one of my sons went there, I now understand why. Um, and the guy who came up with it later became the secretary of education for the United States. But that's his bread. When you go to Brown, there are zero required classes, zero grades. Let that sink in. So if I would think back to me in college, I would have partied and not learned anything. But that's not who they get that wants to go to Brown. By making, when I went to college, you had to have so many science, so many of this, so many of that. And if you really didn't care about that, that subject, you wanted the easiest course in it. So for geology, there was a class called, that we called rocks for jocks, or the football players could learn, you know, this is sulfur, this is, you know, whatever. So I basically went to college, a top university, and cheated myself out of an education because I was shooting for A's as opposed to knowledge. So I took the dumbest classes so I could have all A's and learn nothing. 
At Brown, the English department, since nobody's required to take a class in English, will get zero funding if nobody takes English courses. So those teachers have to make brilliant classes that students share and go, oh my God, this is such a great class. And same for the history and same for the science. So it is a buyer's market. The students are the buyers. If they don't take classes in those departments, bye-bye faculty, bye-bye your job. Now you flipped it. Every class has to be the best it can be or it goes out of existence. Compare that to mine, which is the most popular class at UCLA in my era was the history of jazz. It was taught in a theater with 800 seats. Only athletes could get into the class. And the final was they played a couple records that they played during the semester. And if you could name who was on the record, you passed the class. Um, that's a joke, okay? Whereas when my son would tell me what some of the hardest classes to get into at Brown were these obscure things, but they sounded so interesting to people, that there were waiting lists to get that one professor in the world that would teach it. So that fundamentally changed. We're measuring the wrong things, okay? You know, standardized tests were not designed to help students. They were designed to help governments figure out, is it working? Now, part of my whole idea of disruption and everything came from a book that I read when I was very young on this very topic, which was called The Peter Principle. And The Peter Principle is people will rise to their level of incompetence. It's the exact opposite of what you were taught. You thought the best person becomes the leader. So if you are a great teacher, fantastic, the kiddies love you, everything, they promote you to principal. Principal has nothing to do with being with students. It has to do with dealing with faculty and dealing with parents and that stuff right, and, and budgets for the school. So if you're lousy at being a principal, you will stay a principal for your whole career. If you're really good at being a principal, then they move you to school board, which is politicians and all kinds of lobbying and all kinds of other stuff. If you're lousy at that, you'll stay at school board for the rest of your life. So everybody rises to the level of incompetence which means most of the people that you will deal with in business are bad at what they're doing and live in fear of losing that job. You now have a competitive advantage when you go to them because you can convince them that what you're doing will help them keep their job. Well, that, that, that change will empower them in their eyes or their boss or whatever it may be. And you've now flipped the whole script on any sale you'll ever do. And so I've done huge deals with corporations where I didn't know anybody walking in, but just exploiting that one way that people actually function in organizations suddenly gives you the keys to the kingdom. Most people today in today's world are paid enough money not to quit, but not enough money to care. And I've been, I've had run companies where I've had 200, 300,000 employees. And the vast majority aren't there to make the company successful, right? They're there to get that check. And so our educational system has, has taken that drive and that individually out of people. Now, I have a competitive advantage. If you read Disrupt You, my competitive advantage was I'm dyslexic. I was told I was stupid from day one. I think different. Well, it turns out thinking different is an adaptable skill for surviving and thriving and great for being an entrepreneur. So I had so much problem reading in school that whenever a group assignment was given, my hand went up first so I could lead the team. I could delegate to everybody what I couldn't do so I could mask my insecurities and my inabilities. Well, I learned how to delegate and manage. What a great training to be an entrepreneur, right? I've been in tech. I've taught at the largest engineering university in the U.S. for 10 years. I'm not an engineer. All these years, I've never learned one line of code. And I love ChatGPT now because I can actually have it create code for me and not worry about any of that. Um, but what I learned how to do was, was, was delegate and empower my employees and empower my teams to do their best work. 
Um, and a fun trick if you have a startup out there that I always did. In the beginning, you'll have more time than you have business. And everybody has skill sets. There's a coder, there's this guy that does graphics, there's a, you know, whatever on your team. Sit down as a team, as a tribe, and pick one nonprofit each year and work on some project for that nonprofit. So I had a software company. We did the first software for kids that couldn't communicate with their parents. So they could hit a slap tab and, and I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, you know. Um, and did tons of this early learning software that changed people's lives. When I bump into these people 40 years later, they don't remember what they got paid. They don't remember, did we hit that quarter? Did we you know, have a good Christmas at retail? They remember those pro bono projects, but some of them are still being used today. And so there's a way to put purpose into our daily lives. Um, the secret to happiness is to solve for others. Mm. The well purpose said. of life is to live a life of purpose. Hmm. That doesn't have to be in conflict with having a profit and making money. You know, I am a capitalist. I capitalism solved poverty. It didn't cause poverty. Um, now, the choice is again up to each of us how we want to use these tools. So, I back to your fundamental question. I think. Fighting city hall and trying to change the bureaucracy of education hmm. when you're one click away from 14,000 years of human knowledge. Totally. Teach people how to seek out information. Yeah. And that's what excites me about chat GPT. So um, I'm not plugging it because it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, limited uh, collector's book, not for everybody. But I was trying to think, I've had billionaires write the forwards to all my books and I've made a list of who I thought would be right on my new one and what the topic should be. And then it dawned on me because of the topic of the book. I'm going to have chat GPT write the forward <laughs> to my new book. And I signed off on the proofs uh, two nights ago. Um, and it did a pretty good job. It could have done a better job. And when I was talking to my son, he said, well, it's your fault it didn't do a good, better job because you could go in and say, you know, same thing, use a better, varied, you know, sentence structure. Right. You're the one giving the instructions. I, I could have given it better instructions, but all the research, all the information, everything that wanted to be in it. And then as a, as a goof one night, I said, write a book proposal for a sequel to Disrupt You by Jay Savage. That's all I said. And what I love to do, you then go one, two, three, and it spits out pages. And it was a pretty good book proposal. And it had a lot of stuff that I would have forgotten that should be in if I ever did a, a sequel. I was really impressed with the job that it did and as it should be. And so everybody should be playing with these tools just like you should have gotten on a computer when they first came out. Right. You should have gotten on the web when it first came out. You right. should have gotten a crypto and all these things to understand. And so play with it and see what you, you learn and see what you uncover. You know, I, I kind of have to ask though, are you not scared that it will write your next book for you and you know, Jay is suddenly not needed as an author anymore? That solves a problem. If, if, if knowledge can be disseminated and I no longer am the bottleneck, then that's a huge advantage. If, you know, there's glasses that I worked on uh, that are under NDA that's coming out uh, next year that give you subtitles for 40 languages. So you could be speaking your native German to me and I could follow the conversation. And more importantly, as I travel the world, I will have two pair of glasses. So you see the love of your life sitting at that bar. You walk up, you give that person the glasses, and you start having a conversation, and we're all connected. You know, 40 languages, you're, I mean, middle of Papua New Guinea is not going to help you. But, you know, um, any five-star hotel that I'm going to be in, pretty, pretty much uh, be one of those 40 languages. But that tool excites me. Anything that takes the barriers that artificially separate us, you know, you know, fly over the world. You don't see nation boundaries, you know, you know, I, I didn't have your, your, I didn't grow up in a country where uh, learning multiple languages was the norm. I speak two languages, English and sarcasm. That's it. I have a son who's fluent in, in Chinese and Japanese and it blows my mind. He's worked in Asia when they see that he's a blonde, blue eyed, you know, after they talk to him on the phone, they're like, you know, They're looking for the hidden camera trick. Um, 
But learning a language may be relegated to the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is the times where you know so many of these things are changing. I do, I do see this. There's like a red thread though, in like one one is solving problems and being adapted or adaptability of of you know who we are in any moment. But the other one is also being human and really understanding what that what that means. Even right, like I think when you talk about empowered individuals that know that only they can do it if they choose to do it if they believe that they can do it, right. I think this is going to become even more important is this awareness of who we are, this awareness of who we are in the ecosystem at large and um, yeah, in which way we can actually create but, but a world also, that's worth living in. I also think what it is to be human, that, that very notion is fungible. Because mm. what it is to be human now is different than what it was to be human 5,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago. All right. It, I mean, the there, there's some similarities and then there's some significant no, differences. I'll give you yeah. the, the yeah. vastest difference. <laughs> if you go back to the era of Joan of Arc, mm. okay, which wasn't that long ago, mm -hmm. most people did not have an inner voice. The one that's talking to you right now and saying, what's he talking about? Okay. They didn't think with language. Mm. So the first people that developed that thought they were hearing voices or thought it was God talking to them when in fact it was to their conscience. You know, um, we didn't see the color blue until 2000 years ago. So we're adapting and changing in how we're connecting the synaptic nerves in our brains to solve for our environment. Mm. So what it is to be human and what we think of that, um, you know, was love always that or was love a construct for survival? You know, mm. we can get into lots of phys uh, philosophical. That's things. what happens once you're one hour in. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to get get you to you know share like a closing statement for everyone who's like fully followed us down this rabbit hole. Um, oh, if if you made it this far, yeah. And I'm, I I I write wrote my books to help people. I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't coach. I don't do anything that that, that takes money from people. If you really want to get started on your life. If you go to jsamit.com, J-A-Y-S-A-M-I-T.com, I have free workbooks that you can download and start working on coming up with your life plan right now. There's no upsell. There's nothing. They're basically companions because when people read the books, Disrupt You or whatever, you get all fired up at the end of the chapter. And then if you're like me, you read the next chapter and you forgot what you were fired up about last one. <laughs> so the workbooks let you write down and, and start mapping out how to turn you know a, a dream into a goal you know a dream with the deadline is a goal you know and and what the steps are and how to do it so if you're really serious about doing something that's why i spent the time that's why i go on on this stuff to really that's my way of paying it forward and uh in in future proofing you the, the last chapter is you know if you're lucky enough to be successful and it is luck at the end of the day you know pay it forward and, and the examples of some of the people that I've met and, and some of the ways people were paying it forward are humbling mm. in both the scope of the change that they can do. And it's not just paying it forward financially, right? Writing a check is the easiest thing. Um, you know, when Bill Gates uh, retired from Microsoft, you know, he became the richest guy in the world. It's kind of tough to be motivated to do something, right? And he was a young guy and you're going to get bored. And a friend of his knew how to needle and then said, you know, you're not going to be remembered as the richest guy because there's always going to be a richest guy. But you know, nobody in history has ever eradicated disease from the planet. Now Bill was fired up. What could it do? What will it take? We have the drug for polio. How do we get it to the four corners? How do we make refrigeration that doesn't need electricity? You know, he was problem solving again. He was on fire. And then you discover in doing that, that there's 2 billion people that don't have access to a toilet. Well, how do we solve sewage and cleanliness without fresh water? How do we solve fresh water? How do we solve energy? And suddenly he spewed off all these new companies doing amazing things, not to chase the dollar, but to give meaning and purpose. To, to Anybody can write a check to charity, but... No charity is going to solve things. They don't have his skill set and his drive. And so I find that very inspirational on every level. 
you can make a difference. And making that difference will make you happy. Don't look within. That's, 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 that's how Jay sees the world. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Jay, for tuning in with us and for sharing your wisdom and your insights. It was a pleasure to have you on the podcast. 